Welcome back to Overtime. Palantir and L3 Harris announcing a strategic partnership to bring together Palantir's AI and L3 Harris's hardware to help the military make better decisions, faster, improve communications systems, and accelerate L3 Harris's digital transformation. So joining me right here at CNBC headquarters on set, Palantir CEO and co-founder Alex Karp and L3 Harris chair and CEO Chris Kubasic. Gentlemen, welcome. Great to have you both here. Good to be here. Yeah. All right, so I got to start with earnings because L3 Harris, you just also reported earnings, uh, a beat and a raise. You're boosting your margin guidance as well. How much of this is a reflection of growing defense demand? How much of this is a reflection of the normalization of supply chains? Yeah, look, Maureen, it was a great, uh, great quarter. This is the fifth consecutive quarter we've exceeded expectations. And it really goes back a couple years to the strategy that we've laid out. Everything we're putting in place is starting to fall together. You know, when I look at our uh, board, we have uh, about half the board is new, half my leadership team is new. We brought all the employees back, did away with hybrid earlier this year. So I obviously have to recognize and thank them for a great quarter. Supply chain is easing. Our LHX Next initiative is working. So really everything is coming together nicely. We bought two, uh, made two acquisitions uh, that are aligned with the future of the uh, warfare and national defense strategy. We divested non-core assets. So if you're going to be the trusted disruptor, you got to have change. You got to embrace change. We've had a lot of change and, um, you know, it's uh, it's exciting. But the hallmark of the strategy is partnerships. So mm -hmm. I'm actually more excited to be on stage here with Alex to talk about our partnership yep. than I am a great third quarter. So that's how I look at it. So let's talk about this partnership. Alex, you've inked a number of them at Palantir um, in recent months, even just Microsoft, Oracle. What does inking a partnership with another Defense Prime enable? Well, first of all, delighted to be here. Congratulations on the quarter. Um, you know, there's the there's a, a lot of reasons to deepen our partnership and expand it, but primarily, actually, Chris, you know, he's a real disruptor. Um, he drives innovation uh, inside of his company. And um, then, quite frankly, he's better networked and understands the D.C. environment, uh, certainly in a way that, you know, we may never. Um, and so the combination of and then, you know, what I think our nation needs is the Americans, America's best unifying around where we have a structural advantage, which is the integration of hardware and software. It's, China and Russia are just not as good at software, and the integration of both uh, allows you to produce more lethal technologies. So how do we move from passive defense to we scare the, our adversaries every day, obviously in a way that they can't replicate? And the obvious way you do that is you move to AI-driven targeting uh, with ethical uh, means that, that's going to require software with the most disruptive companies in D.C., led by, you know, a quite inspirational leader. So, you know, we want to bring uh, innovation to America commercially. Also, they're a massive commercial company, just purely. One of the things about L3 is that they're, like, one of the things that unifies us is we're not really defense integrators. We're commercial companies that are patriotic. And so how do we get the best patriotic companies to produce the most lethal technology in the world for America and not for our adversaries, and how do we get it to the, the DOD in ways that are cheaper, mm -hmm. in ways that the margins are better, and it's a great partner. So, so how do you do that, Chris? And I, I think about, I mean, you're a defense prime on a number of programs, but you're also a subcontractor on some, like Titan, which Palantir is the software prime and the defense prime on. So, so what does this enable from your standpoint? How quickly can you develop these new technologies, next generation capabilities for the warfighter? Yeah. Well, as you and I have talked about, you know, the, the, the arsenal of democracy. So you go back to World War II, right, where the defense industrial base and the government worked collaboratively to build 300,000 airplanes, 85,000 tanks, and 9,000 ships to win the war. The future of warfare and the future uh, arsenal of democracy is not more platforms, not more planes, ships, and tanks. It's the convergence of our leading edge hardware, software, and AI. So you mentioned Titan, a perfect example. I'm happy to prime, sub, merchant supplier. They're leading this. We're providing all the resilient comms, all the communication architecture, the communication hardware. There's another program. We talk about real-time targeting. We have targeting systems. Think of those as the eyes uh, for the warfighter, usually uh, airborne platforms. And we can identify targets. We've integrated their AI 
it, it lightens the workload for the warfighter. It increases the probability of detection, and you end up with a better result. So and, and, it's all about shortening the kill chain. And and, and, and what you, we've seen in Ukraine and in other places is the old ways of doing battle with like kind of hard, large systems that are not AI driven just cannot survive on the battlefield anymore. The, the Russians and our peer to peer adversaries are using electronic warfare. And so what you're going to have to do is deliver a cheaper, more accurate payload that is the convergence of AI autonomous systems and hardware. Uh, and that's got to be done then. And then you also have to produce at rates we haven't produced. So how do you get the manufacturing to work better? How do you get the supply chain to work better? How do you bring violence to our enemies uh, while using ethical standards that the West believes in? So when do you attack? Under what conditions do you attack? Do you attack if there are civilians? How many civilians? In what area? How, what radius to schools? How do you make sure that the people we're hitting are our actual adversaries? How do you take out the dumb, but keep leave the intelligent generals alive uh, it, uh, that are kind of misaligned with their own, uh, their own country and take out the idiots or vice versa? These things are these things are really important decisions. Uh, and then for Americans watching this, Americans want to know that their dollar spent is a dollar well spent, whether that's in the DoD or any other place. So. Commercial entities, commercial companies that are also patriotic, or in our case, patriotic first and commercial equally, are important also for the integrity of our country. Every single person is wondering, okay, of course I want the best war system in the world, and I want something our adversaries couldn't replicate. What did it cost? What were the margins? Did it work? Is this something that is commercially viable? Would a commercial entity ever buy this? Those are very legitimate and important questions for the integrity of our society. And our partnership goes a long way to answering them. Mm -hmm. Because quite frankly, there are some rooms where I'm more welcome, mostly uh, people who are investors in Palantir or often in many cases on the battlefield. And there are some rooms where they would rather talk to Chris and I'd rather have them talk to whoever they'd rather talk to. We need to get the best product on the battlefield, and that often requires partnership. What are the lessons learned, to the extent you can talk about them, about AI deployed on the battlefield? I think about the Middle East, where CENTCOM's using MAVEN. Palantir's involved in that program. It's now being deployed to other parts of the world as well. Just today, the White House uh, issuing this national security memorandum on AI, talking about that, the fact that they need more AI deployed, deployed more quickly to the warfighter in military context, but that there need to be guardrails in place well, as well. Um, when we took over MAVEN, it was, I mean, AI was viewed as a joke. We took it over because Silicon Valley notoriously thinks the job of Silicon Valley is to get rich first and to not support our warfighters. So we took that over, and then um, what the DOD, and, and I'm, I'm very happy to see Jake Sullivan writing about it's very important, has learned is the, the being able to identify and take out our adversaries in a way that's preci more precise, quicker, uh, and more lethal than uh, anyone else in the world can gives us a structural advantage, a structural A, because it's quicker and better and safer and more violent, and it's also better because our adversaries just are not that great at doing it. And so we, what, we, what the U.S. has learned in Project MAVEN, what the Ukrainians have learned, what the Israelis have learned is this is a structural way both to integrate the, the base, so also it makes companies that are already valuable five times more valuable because you can control what you buy, you control the manufacturing, you can control right down to where you talk. You can use fewer munitions. Uh, the munitions can be lower cost, but they have to be produced quicker. You can explain to your people. So all these lessons, what they're basically seeing is Congress, the DOD, the White House are saying, wait a minute, we have this amazing structural advantage and we need to take advantage of it. There's a banality that we forget. Almost everybody in the AI world is American. And then almost everyone who's doing kind of uh, munitions and targeting at scale with hardware and software is also American. And these are, and w another advantage we have is we can just transform our industry because we have exceedingly agile CEOs and work environments, unlike Europe. Mm. So th what we're basically seeing across le the legislative and DOD is people saying, wait a minute, we need to do a lot more of this. We need to see partnerships. We need to see people working together. And we need to bring this to our warfighter. And that's exactly what that memorandum basically says. Mm. Speaking of agile work environments, I mean, you just talked about the fact that you have this next program. You're going to, one of the things in this release, you're going to hit your cost saving targets a year early. Right. Uh, right. You are also a commercial customer of Palantir Absolutely. as well. So, so when we, at a time where more broadly investors and company CEOs are saying, okay, application layer of AI, 
where is it going to go in my company? How am I going to deploy it? How much am I going to invest? And most importantly, what's my return on investment going to look like? What are you seeing at L3 Harris? We're, we're, we're seeing great progress. So we, we've laid out a transformation of the company. We call it LHX Next. First phase was really focused on cost takeout. We're going to meet those goals, beat them, and exceed them. The second phase is transforming the company. Right, And in the old days, you just blow up your system, spend hundreds of millions of dollars, and shut everything down for years. We have hundreds of systems, ERP systems, finance, labor, um, manufacturing. The Foundry product has the ability to extract the data, knit it together, and get it to us in, in real time. So we're getting data timely and accurate. We're able to make database decisions. It ultimately leads to a better company, more agile company, more profitable. It's been a great partnership. This is something that's going to change for uh, for the for the benefit of the uh, the shareholders and and and, and our customers. Palantir, third best company, third best performer in the S and P 500, even though it's a new entrant. Um, a lot of analysts don't necessarily fully understand, I think, what you do on all aspects, but investors certainly seem to get it. Particularly on the commercial side, I realize there's been a reacceleration in the U.S. government business, but the commercial business is really what's propelling the stock. Um, what are you seeing, especially as you do have these artificial intelligence platform boot camps and adoption levels? Um, well, look, I, I mean, first of all, to your first, you know, intelligence, intelligent people learn from their mistakes and learn to realize when they made a mistake in the pattern, everyone else becomes an analyst or an advisor. So, you know, people have been saying we're overvalued for the last 20 years. People have been saying we did, our products would make us profitable, that, that we would not be able to become a juggernaut, that we would not become gap profitable, we'd not get on the S&P. And, you know, keep saying that about us. We love it. It discourages people from doing anything like what we're doing. And we are winning. Now, why are we winning in U.S. commercial? Because we learned in the government that what makes uh, – AI valuable is the ability to manage algorithms or large language models. Every, every financial analyst it wakes up in the morning and after, with notable exceptions that we revere, really revere, wake up in the, wakes up in the morning and after they stay at Motel 6, they have a huge opinion about how to manage large language models. It's completely theoretical and idiotic. If you want to manage large language models or AI, the infrastructure that allows you to manage them is where the actual value is. The actual, the large language model is essentially a commodity that you can value and use depending on cost and veracity. And they completely don't get it. But you know who does get it? Our commercial American customers. And despite the fact that we barely have a sales team and that I'm providing my pontifications of truth, including America is a great country, which many of them don't like, our allies deserve protection, Israel is in the right, whatever is pissing them off, they're still buying the product. And the reason they're buying it is because our ontology and our AIP allow you to deploy and use AI in a way where it changes your margins, it changes your go-to-market, it changes your ability to kill or take out adversaries in a much safer way with much lower costs. And American companies are dynamic and interesting and run by some of the best people in the world, some of whom are much better at partying cooler than you'd ever <laughs> imagine on TV. Uh, and, and they adopt. And so, you know, it's like... Do you want to believe what the librarian says about a book, or do you want to go out in the world and see if it works? And we are in the business of making our commercial customers work. And sure, yeah, we have a ton of player haters. Keep hating on us. Hmm. That's, final, yeah. Okay, I was going to say, final question for, for both of you, really. I'm not going to get into the election specifically, um, but when you look out to 2025, no matter what that outcome looks like, what are the key areas, whether it's regulation, whether it's defense spending, whether it's something else, what are the key areas of policy that are going to need to be addressed? Well, look, I, I've said it before, the whole ecosystem needs to be on a wartime footing, right? We need a budget. I've said before on the show, China and Russia don't have continuing resolutions. We need a budget. We need the DOD to award contracts quicker. I don't care if they're commercial or traditional defense. I think there's huge opportunities uh, to, to allow our company and other companies to be treated as a commercial enterprise. Everybody in DOD and DC loves commercial companies. Put out the RFP, let us propose, make a decision, and let's move quickly. And then, of course, you know, we have all in industry have been building up uh, capacity. There's not enough capacity 
in, in the defense industrial base for the demand that we need. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, let's get a budget, let's make some awards, give us a chance to execute. I think the future is hardware, software, and AI. I think we're well positioned for the long term. I couldn't be more excited to be here with Alex and be a partner of uh, Palantir. So I obviously agree with, with, with what Chris said. I, I think for me the most important thing any administration can do is articulate a patriotic message. America and the way we organize things is a, something we are willing to fight for. And then once you've articulated we are going to fight for our way of life, a lot of decisions follow. And then how do you fight for it in the DOD context? Well, if hardware, software, uh, hybrid AI is our advantage, then maybe you should look at, like, okay, well, who are the people who do it? Mm -hmm. hey, to, buying software and AI from somebody who's never built any system that's ever worked, or buying it from a PowerPoint, or not, a giving, not having a commercial vendor preference is literally suicide. So, you know, but the first thing is to say, and then I would start renaming things. It's like, I don't understand why we have a Department of Defense. We should have a part, Department of Offense. Like, you know, and the other, I personally believe this with this, like, we have to have red lines and then we should go ahead and violate them to show people how serious we are. Like, why do we wait till our enemies attack? It makes no sense. It does not lead to peace. You know, you have this famous thing, it's a paradox of thrift, where if you oversave, you get poorer, which every progressive learns and it's tattooed on our bodies. There's a paradox of violence. If you never use violence, the world gets more violent. And so we need patriotism and competence and a willingness to use violence. And I don't know why we wait to people get up and hurt us, kidnap us. And last not least, as I've said over and over, if you touch an American citizen, we will go after you. We'll go after your assets. We'll go after everything. We can keep on going for generations. We cannot allow people to just kidnap and kill Americans wantonly and then say we're going to have a memorandum at the United Nations, essentially an academic institution that pushes papers for despots. So we, we really yeah. need to change our footing on this. And by the way, we're in a position to do it because our economy is the strongest in the world. We're the only people producing AI. We have the best CEOs in the world and we have the best war fighters in the world. All right. Palantir CEO Alex Karp, L3 Harris CEO Chris Kubasic. Thank you both for joining me here on set. Good to be here. Thank, Thank you. Thanks. All right, big exclusive there.